Um, Louis a principal software engineering manager over on Chakra. He's been in the compiler space, the performance space, and the security space since he started here at Microsoft, first on C++. Over in eight or nine days, he jumped uh, into the web working on the JavaScript engine, and he's helped us re-architect Chakra um, to get us in a leader position over the last few years. So without further ado, uh, Louis. Thank you. Good morning. Well, first I'd like to say thank you actually to Hitesh, who's been making most of these slides, and for Brendan for putting the fi finished touches on all of these, and um, thank you guys for the help. So um, JavaScript has become like the most popular programming language um, these days. So, uh, and web pages are using, have been using more and more JavaScript. Um, and pages have become more and more complicated, and for web application and all that, and the performance of JavaScript has become more and more important compared to where it, were. it, it was in the early days. Uh, oops, wrong way. <laughs> so you recognize uh, that diagram from uh, Christians from a previous talk about kind of like the overall um, edge picture, and we are right there in the little corner up there. Uh, <laughs> So Chakra is the component that does touch a lot of the other pieces in Edge. Uh, the DOM is probably the part where we interface the most with. Um, and we're going to dive into now. So before we had Chakra, we had the JScript, the DLL uh, engine, which was from the early days of IE until IE8. Um, we came to a point where the design of the, the architecture of the engine was not scaling to the demand of JavaScript. Um, we made the decision that we needed to, to rewrite the engine from scratch. We pretty much got everything, threw out everything out of the window except some pieces in the parsers. And we came up with JScript 9, the DLL for IE9. And that was a pretty big change. It was a big project. Um, and all of a sudden, we saw a big perf boost um, from Internet Explorer. Um, and then we went to Edge. Um, we did the same thing as MSHTML. We removed a lot of the legacy code that we had for backcompat, and we renamed the DLL to Chakra the DLL. Um, and then in the RS1 days, we decided to go op open source and make Chakra Core that DLL available for the outside for people wanting to embed JavaScript in their application or for having Node support. Uh, we also went cross-plat at, at the same time, so we can run now on Windows, of course, Linux, Mac, um, and we've got some unsupported port to iOS and Android. Um, so we're on GitHub um, and uh, all our sources there, and we, that's, we operate pretty much in the open. So the big difference between Chakra Core and Chakra is kind of like the part at the bottom. It's pretty much our interface with Edge. Uh, so we've got the older API that's there and the support for WWAs. Um, Chakra Core is pretty much the guts of Chakra, which has our JSRT API, which is our new API, our more modern API. Um, and then we've got the front end, which has the parser bytecode generator. The back end is the part that generates the code, that's the, the, the JIT. Uh, the library has all of the support for functionality, uh, the, the, the library support of JavaScript. So for helping with arrays, regex, strings, whatever. Um, and then what we've got the we've got the execution machinery, which is kind of the part of the runtime that's running the code, the interpreter, the type system, um, and inline caches support for speeding up property accesses. And at the bottom box is the memory uh, manager. The memory manager includes the garbage collection, but it also includes all the memory management uh, that we do in Chakra. Um, it's all integrated together with, with the GC um, and part allocating the code for the JIT and dealing with the out of proc aspect of the JIT now. So let's go through a little script. We've got script that comes from uh, from Edge, uh, we receive it through our hosting API. 
And so we've got a little function, just simple function, just doing A plus B. Um, we convert the source to UTF-8. It goes through the parser. Uh, the parser has, um, there's kind of, there's two forms of parsing. You might have heard the term deferred parsing. It's the initial, we do an initial scan of the, uh, of the script. Um, at that point, we don't build AST, which is kind of the slowest part of the, the parse. We actually just look for syntax errors, and we're building some internal data structure to figure out where all the different functions are. So that scan is supposed to be really fast um, because we don't want to be doing the expensive part of building the AST for the code that's not going to get called at all. There's a lot of code that never, never gets called. Um, once it does get called, then we produce an AST, which is NAPSTAC, abstract syntax tree. So it's kind of a, a tree representation of the whole script, which contains detail, details about scoping, uh, where the functions are, the variables, the expressions. Um, then the AST is fed through to the bytecode generator. The bytecode generator transforms the AST into a format that's more appropriate for an interpreter to run on. Um, it's also a good format to feed to the JIT and to make it easy to optimize. So it's kind of a linear representation of the, ex the instructions in a function, and it's register-based. So we've got these registers are allocated by the bytecode generator. That feeds in into the interpreter, which does go step-by-step -step over each instruction to execute them. It interacts with the library, uh, the type system for any objects that are created or referenced or anything. And Eventually, we've got the JIT to generate faster code for the function. So how to generate fast code for JavaScript? Well, JavaScript does not, have, does not have any types. Everything is dynamic. So it's not something as easy as a plus. Could be just adding two integers. You know, you add those, you get two. But it might not be integers. You might be adding an integer with a string. What do you get then? Well, you convert the integer to a string, of course, obvious, and then you do a string concat. Um, or you might be putting two strings together directly, get two strings, um, or a string plus an integer. Again, you convert the, string to, the, the integer to a string. Or you might be adding two objects together. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a two-string method on the object that you call, and you, then you get two strings, you concatenate them, so you get, of course, the two-string on an object is going to be object-object. Totally makes sense. <laughs> and then you might be just concatenating an object to a string, and what do you get out of that? Whoa, what, what happened there? Oh, oh, that thing is not really an object. It's an empty scope, of course. So it's an empty scope, and you've got a string, which is an empty string, and you do plus on a string, so that converts a string to a number, so you get zero. So what happened if you do a string plus the curly curly? Well, for that you get object object. <laughs> because <laughs> what happened if you take the, that previous example and you put parens over that thing? Well, of course now it's going to be an object because there's the parens. It's not going to parse as an empty scope. So as as you see, just something easy as plus can have you know a lot of different meanings in JavaScript, and it's not. In terms of generating code, it's not just a matter of emitting an add instruction. In fact, this is the call graph of all the code that can get triggered by doing a plus in JavaScript inside the runtime. So when the interpreter has A plus B, this is the different path that might be taken through the engine uh, at that point. So how can we generate code for something like this? We can't generate all of this whenever we have an add operation uh, in, in the code. So let's go through little example of the life cycle of how we end up having something that's remotely fast. Um, so we have a new example here with, with a loop just going over an array. Uh, let's assume that this function is called with an array of integers. So we're going to have a loop counting the number, all the, all the elements of this array. So the first time the function is called, um, we're going to go execute it in the bytecode interpreter. So the bytecode interpreter is going to go through the list of, of bytecode instructions one by one, executing every single one of them. Uh, as we go through each of these instructions, we will collect profile data for the types of the variables that are accessed by the, uh, by the, 
but a function. So we'll, we'll record that the parameter that was passed was in fact an array, and it was in fact an array of integers. Um, we'll keep track that, that all the different types, if there were a function call in there, we would figure out what it ends up calling, such that if we g generate code for it, we can inline that function maybe if it's a good inline candidate. Um, so all that stuff is gathered as profile data through the interpreter. This loop, though, could be maybe this array is huge, and we don't want to be stuck in the interpreter for very long going through this whole array. So we have the ability to generate code just for a loop body. So we call that a JIT loop body. Um, so at that point, as we're noticing, oh, we've gone through a few iterations of this loop, um, let's call the JIT to generate just the loop part of this code. The jitting happens in the background in, um, in Chakra, so it's triggered on, on a separate thread. And now it's actually out of proc, so that thread is going to communicate with the out of proc JIT. Um, and then we'll keep on running the loop in the interpreter. Once the JIT is finished, with, at, at every iteration of the loop, the interpreter will check with the JIT, are you done yet? And if it's done, then we will transfer control of execution to uh, the JIT code uh, from the JIT for that loop body. So we'll run that loop body um, code, and then once we're done with it, we'll go back to the interpreter to execute the rest of the function. So I've got some pseudocode of what's generated there. Um, and um, as you can see, we do a lot of uh, check um, as we enter. So we, we kind of transferred control in the middle of execution in, inside the interpreter. Um, and we had some profile data at that time. And it's possible, though, that by the time we generated the profile data and we generated the code, that the state of, of, of the variable has changed. So we have to verify the state of everything, because um, maybe the number that length uh, was a, had a getter on it, and it decided to change that array to an array of strings. And now we need to do some concats in there. Um, so, so what do we do is we have the concept of, of uh, the bailout, um, which, oops, that's the wrong button, that one right there. Um, the bail, a bailout for us means we're going to transfer the control back to the interpreter. So as we're, as we're running the JIT code, if we have one of those check, and these checks might happen in the middle of the function, they don't always happen at the top, we're going to notice, oh, there was an assumption that we made that is actually invalid at this point. We can't run the rest of this code because it invalidates these assumptions. We need to transfer control to the interpreter. So we're going to collect the state of all the variables that the interpreter needs to execute, um, create an interpreter frame, and then resume execution in the interpreter at the bytecode instruction where we're currently at, are at in the JIT. Once we've done these checks, though, then we're guaranteed if there's nothing in there that can invalidate our assumptions, we're guaranteed that the types is going to stay the same. Uh, so for this loop, we can just, we know that i is an integer, total is going to be an integer, and we can just loop extract the data from this array directly, and we have some pretty tight code. So but when we return after the JIT, we're back in the interpreter again. Um, Eventually, if sum is, is getting called enough times, we'll trigger what we call the simple JIT. The simple JIT is, runs a fast version of our JIT. So we're, we're not quite sure this function is super hot yet. So we don't want to pay the price of triggering the full JIT. Uh, but we want something a little faster than the interpreter. So it's kind of like our second gear um, versus the full JIT would be our third gear. Um, the, full JIT, uh, the simple JIT generates. It, it runs actually the normal JIT. It just does not run the global optimizer, which is the very expensive part. That's the part that does all the type inf inference and the more expensive optimization. Um, so it ends up generate code, which is actually it's kind of like the code that we used to have in IE9. We didn't have the ability to bail out back to the interpreter. So we couldn't take advantage of all of that type inference that we do now. Um, so every instruction had to check inside the loop, is this really an array? Um, if it is, just get the length. Otherwise, go to the runtime and figuring out how to get the length property of this thing that I have, which is not an array. Uh, and every operation has to recheck everything because we never know, you know out of this if. We don't know if i was an int because we don't know which side we went. So we have to check that i is an int again. 
So we have to check all of these things. So it's a lot easier to generate this code, though. That's why we use a simple JIT. Um, but then maybe we'll be stuck in the loop again in the simple JIT code. But simple JIT code has the ability also to generate a JIT loop body. And we can go run this loop in the optimized loop, come back to the simple JIT code. Now, once the simple JIT code has been called quite a few times, we're like, well, maybe it's probably, it looks like this code is called quite a bit. It probably is worth to call the full JIT on uh, this function. So we'll call the full JIT to generate a fully optimized version of this function. Now we can come in in this function for, from the beginning. We do have some minimal checks again, but then we've got the fully optimized code, which if our array happens to be an array of integer, we're going to be running super fast. Well, now what happens if we're called with an array of floats? Um, well, now all of a sudden we'll trigger a bailout and we'll have to go back to the, to, to the interpreter and we're going to run this instance of the function in the interpreter. Uh, this will update the profile data that we have. So now the profile data say, will say this array is an array event sometimes and sometimes it's an array float. So every time sum is called, we'll keep calling the same JIDA code. Um, and if we keep calling it with an array of floats, we'll keep bailing out. If we're noticing that we're bailing out too frequently, I mean, if, if we're getting most of the time an array event and once in a while we're getting an array of float, the code we have is pretty good. It's going to do really, really well. But if we're calling a lot with array of floats, we'll want to trigger what we call a rejit. So a rejit is like, OK, this thing that we generated was too optimistic. Let's rejit a new version of this code that's going to handle all the different kind of types that we're getting. Um, so the rejit will generate a new version of the code. So in this case, now we'll say, well, if we JIT code that can handle float math, we'll be able to handle arrays of ints and arrays of floats. So um, let's generate this code. Now we just need to make sure that we have an array of integers or floats. We can do the math as floating point math, and we can do something that's still pretty good, much better than having to go to the runtime for every single operation. So this is pretty much how we handle um, all the different typing that might happen. Uh, we do the same thing for like different objects. If we have objects that are coming in of different types, we'll, we'll assume if we always see the same type, we'll generate code for, for the object of that type. And then if we start seeing new types, we might generate something that, that can handle polymorphism. Uh, and we have different version of that. And the rejit and the bailout mechanism is what allows us to generate code that's very specialized for the data that we've seen coming through this function uh, and allows us to handle the dynamic nature of types in JavaScript. 